Okay, tonight we discuss the Maha Tanha Sankhya Sutta, Majjhimanikaya 38, uh, the greater discourse on destruction of craving. Uh, I will read a little bit and then we will discuss. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, another Pindika's park. Now on that occasion uh, a pernicious view had arisen in a bhikkhu named Sati. This is not Sati. Sati, a different name son of a fisherman. Thus, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round of rebirths, not another. Somebody asked this yesterday. Several bhikkhus, having heard about this, went to the bhikkhu Sati and asked him, Friend Sati, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? Exactly so, friends. He tells the truth. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round of rebirths, not another. So he comes from a different tradition. Then those bhikkhus, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus. Friend Sati, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus. For in many ways the Blessed One has stated consciousness, consciousness to be dependently arisen. Since without a condition, there is no origination of con consciousness. Yet, although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by those bhikkhus in this way, the bhikkhu Sati, son of a fisherman, still obstinately adhered to that pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. Very stubborn monk. Since the bhikkhus were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him all that had occurred, adding, Venerable Sir, since we could not detach the bhikkhu Sati, son of a fisherman, from this pernicious view, we have reported this matter to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain bhikkhu thus, Come bhikkhu, tell the bhikkhu Sati, son of a fisherman, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, Venerable Sir, he replied, and he went to the bhikkhu Sati and told him, The teacher calls you, friend Sati. This is like taking you to the principal's office. <laughs> Yes, friend, he re replied, and he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, sat down at, on, at one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Sati, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round of rebirths, not another. Exactly so, Venerable Sir, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the round of rebirths, not another. What is that consciousness, Sati? Venerable Sir, it is that which speaks and feels and experiences here and there the result of good and bad actions misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? 
misguided man this is the the best scolding you can get from the buddha misguided man moga purisa <coughs> deluded man misguided man have i not stated in many ways consciousness to be <coughs> dependently arisen since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness but you misguided man have misrepresented us by your wrong grasp and injured yourself and stored up much demerit for this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time then the blessed one addressed the bhikkhus thus bhikkhus what do you think has this bhikkhu saati son of a fisherman kindled even a spark of wisdom in this dhamma and discipline how could he venerable sir no venerable sir when this was said the bhikkhu saati son of a fisherman sat silent dismayed with shoulders drooping and head down glum and without response then knowing this the blessed one told him misguided man will you be recognized by your own you will be recognized by your own pernicious view i shall question the bhikkhus on this matter although he is recognized by this pernicious view we have this talk thanks to him so let's have metta toward him <laughs> then the blessed one addressed the bhikkhus thus bhikkhus Do you understand the dhamma taught by me as this bhikkhu sati son of a fisherman does when he misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit no venerable sir for in many discourses the blessed one has stated consciousness to be dependently arisen since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness good bhikkhus it is good that you understand the dhamma taught by me thus for in many ways i have stated consciousness to be dependently arisen since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness but this bhikkhu saati son of a fisherman this is the word for kevatta putta kevatta is a uh, um, clan that engaged in fishing activities and they did it generation after generation and the other meaning of this is that they did stinky things and and uh, for lack of a better way to say it that they they just smelled bad just like this view he held <laughs> <laughs> yeah misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit for this will lead to the harm and suffering of this misguided man for a long time actually i lived in a temple in my say um just the first year i was ordained um in a coastal area and the tsunami happened that year um about 6 months into uh my ordination december so i was ordained in june um it's been 20 years and actually fishermen came to live in the temple we were on a mountain place this is in madhya area and um, so many donations came to the temple and but we didn't have enough sometimes to distribute to all those 600 families that came and lived with us and these people have a kind of temper they have the you know knives very sharp knives they they use. i don't have i didn't have any experience as a monk at that time actually um i didn't know how to actually engage in these social activities like um, on the day of tsunami we started cooking we, you know some monks started driving that and that's not a thing that monks do in sri lanka so Uh, all that happening and my friend monk who lived there worried about his family getting washed um, by tsunami and getting killed so i had to console him 
But when we distributed eggs that day, all these people were angry that some fam families did not receive enough and they actually took those fishing knives, cutting knives and came to threaten us. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's something to it, but uh, we, we love them. They, they, they do so much. We love them. Um, they were suffering and we can have compassion toward them. So this discourse is about tanha, um, complete destruction of tanha. Uh, the Buddha mentions tanha in his first sermon. This first sermon is um, turning the wheel of Dhamma, Dhamma Chakka Pavattana Sutta. Um, that is why we say in interviews, trust the wheel of Dhamma. It will you know, it'll take you forward. In it he mentions craving as um, yo, yo ayang tanha, that is this craving, pono bhavika. Pono bhavika means it, it conditions rebirth. Nandi raga sahagata, it has clinging in it. Tatra tatra abhinandini, you delight here, you delight there. That is the nature of craving, liking mind. And when you delight in something, you also tend to dislike something. So looking at that, Bhante simplifies, Bhante V simplifies it to you like it and don't like it mind. Easy to understand, right? So um, that is the nature of craving. And uh, so here um, you understand the complete destruction of it based on the dependent uh, origination, actually dependent co-origination. Um, this comes from Paticca Sang Uppada. Um, uh, Paticca here means dependent. Uppada is arising. Sang Uppada is co-arising. It's, it's, um, it's together arising. And you will see that when you analyze it deeply, this teaching um, does not just land on you. Um, uh, you need to actually pay attention to this teaching and try to actually bring a lot of energy to your mind and pay close attention to it. And this is like that Thai monk who, who never gave any talks and uh, many people, especially his best supporters, wanted to hear from him, hear Dhamma from him. So they invited this monk and um, he and they arranged the place with so much decorations and uh, thousands of people came and the monk also came on the assigned date and he sat in the seat and people were waiting for him to talk. He sat in meditation um, and hours went by he didn't say anything. And the headman went and said and poked him and said, you know, this is time for you to teach. And the monk opened his eyes and said uh, in two words uh, something and he left. He said, this is not about talking, this is about doing. <laughs> <laughs> so today, this is actually not about talking. This is actually engaging in it, doing it and um, really getting the teachings very seriously and sincerely. So um, you will remove many misconceptions based on um, whatever you have perce you know, understood about this teaching um, and you will um, learn it based on the Buddha's own words. Okay. Um, conditionality of consciousness. Because consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent on the I and forms, it is reckoned as I consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the ear and sounds, it is reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the nose and odors, it is reckoned as nose consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the tongue and flavors, it is reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the body and tangibles, it is reckoned as body consciousness. 
When consciousness arises dependent on the mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. This is the six classes of consciousness. And the simile, I think we, c we came to this simile, uh, and you will hear it again from the sutta. Just as fire is reckoned by the particular condition dependent on which it burns. When fire burns dependent on logs, it is reckoned as a log <coughs> fire. When fire burns dependent on fagots, it is reckoned as a fagot fire. When, the fi when fire burns dependent on grass, it is reckoned as a grass fire. When fire burns dependent on cow dung, it is reckoned as a cow dung fire. When fire burns dependent on chef, chef? Yeah. Thank you. it is reckoned as a chef fire. When fire burns dependent on rubbish, it is reckoned as a rubbish fire. So too, consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent on which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent on the eye and forms, it is reckoned as eye consciousness and so on. When consciousness arises dependent on the mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. Um, so the Buddha is asking a general questionnaire here. Um, because do you see this has come to be? Yes, Venerable Sir. Because do you see its origination occurs with that as nutriment? Yes, Venerable Sir. Because do you see with the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation? Yes, Venerable Sir. You see that? The Buddha is looking at cessation. So the basic theory here is imasming sati idang hoti, imasa upada idang upajati, imasming asati idang nahoti, imasa nirodha idang nirujati. When this exists, this comes to be. With the arising of this, this comes to be. With the cessation of this, this ceases. Um, when this is not, this does not come to be. Actually, that comes as the third line and the cessation comes as the fourth line. It's basically the conditionality, the way that it was presented in the Indian context at the time. Because many were talking about various things about how a view, you know, how to justify the view of self they adhere to for a long time it can be very misleading. And um, people, I remember teaching non-self to my good friends in Europe, and they said it's easier to believe that there is a self than trying to understand that there is no self. <laughs> so they just, you know, yeah. Okay, because does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? Has this come to be? Yes, Venerable Sir. Because does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? Does its origination occur with that as nutrition? Yes, Venerable Sir. Because does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? With the cessation of that nutriment is what has come to be subject to cessation? Yes, Venerable Sir. Because is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? This has come to be? Yes, Venerable Sir. Because is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, Venerable Sir. Because is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, Venerable Sir. Because are you thus free from doubt here? This has come to be. Yes, Venerable Sir. Because are you thus free from doubt here? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, Venerable Sir. Because are you thus free from doubt here? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, Venerable Sir. 
So the Buddha is really working hard to make sure that monks get what he is teaching and stands by that teaching and also eradicates any doubt related to this teaching. It's basically saying that see the dependently arising nature so you won't have any doubt about it. Okay? Because has it been seen well by you as it actually is? See, as it actually is, is very important here. Not as it, as you think of it is. <laughs> now this can happen to us, you know. We think this is supposed to be this way, but it's not exactly what we hear, you know. Yatha bhuta jnana dasana. It's like seeing things as they are. Okay? It's with proper wisdom thus. This has come to be. Yes, Venerable Sir. Because has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment? Yes, Venerable Sir. Because has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, Venerable Sir. Let's really unpack this. So, in the previous passage, we saw consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. So, when consciousness arises dependent on the I and forms, it is reckoned as I consciousness. So, you see the nutrients, food for I consciousness to arise here. You need to have a physical eye and you need to have forms, physical working eye and forms. So this eye consciousness won't arise <laughs> without that eye and form. But you tend to think that it lies somewhere here and it will arise. Um, I think the simplest way to put it is that you close your eyes and it won't arise. What you visualize is mental. Mm -hmm. That is mental consciousness arising. It, it has nothing to do with your eye. And you can stare at me and not hear anything I say. Your ear consciousness is actually perhaps arising or not arising, but you are not even paying attention to it. So that's the kind of nutriment we talk about here, just a basic idea of feeding it so that it arises. And when it's not there, it won't arise. It's impossible for it to arise. And the Buddha is asking just this from us. Okay? Because purified and bright as this view is, if you adhere to it, cherish it, treasure it, and treat it as a possession, would you then understand that the Dhamma has been taught as similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping? Nittaranattaya no gahanattaya. Not, no gahanattaya means not for grasping. So, not to, um, just to understand it, just to cross over. And once you use it, it's like uh, the raft, you know, you don't carry it on your shoulder after crossing the river. You just leave it there. <coughs> so, for the purpose of grasping, no venerable sir, because purified and bright as his view is, if you do not adhere to it, cherish it, treasure it and treat it as a possession, would you then understand that the Dhamma has been taught as similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping? Yes, Venerable Sir. Now the Buddha talks about <coughs> actual nutriment, nutriment and dependent origination. This is a uh, um, 
before I say this, um, you know, people generally, beings, we eat, right? We eat a kind of food called uh, just gross food, just uh, food that we eat. Um, and we have three times when we eat it basically, the morning, lunch and evening. Um, you can comprehend that food completely and become enlightened. But the Buddha also went further to see other food like contact at, as food, volition as food. So that's the kind of, uh, uh, and then consciousness as also food. This is how he saw it. And that means you eat more than three times. <laughs> you eat 24 7. <laughs> so basically, what you take in through all the senses, yeah. not just. Yeah. Just yes, yes. And this is why it is so hard to be mindful. And what happens is the food you eat gets digested, and what is needed is taken, and what is not needed is removed. But it does not happen with the food you eat 24-7. <laughs> it just gets, you know, you don't process it unless you are mindful. If you have been negligent for 25 years in your life, you have undigested stuff for 25 years <laughs> that needs to be really digested and, you know, filtered and, and it becomes heavy for people and they end up actually taking their lives or do, doing stuff that are uh, that the actually through living they can understand uh, the, the answers to those questions they faced. This is the power of Dhamma. This is the power of the truth. Uh, and so here we have precepts, we have the supporting conditions, Dhamma, Suttas and we pay attention. Attention, as Delson says, is the best thing you can give to someone. Actually, you are giving attention to the Buddha now. This is a very, 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 very rare thing to happen. <laughs> okay. Because there are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that already have come to be and for the support of those about to come to be. What for? They are physical food as nutriment, gross or subtle, contact as a second, mental volition as a third, and consciousness as the fourth. Now because these four kinds of nutriment have what as their source, we've come to this. Uh, yeah, right after this section. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, I will read again. Now, because these four kinds of nutriment have what as their source, what as their origin, from what are they born and produced? So, all four. These four kinds of nutriment have craving as their source, craving as their origin. They are born and produced from craving. So, while you eat, you can reduce craving actually. And while you eat 24-7, you can also reduce craving <laughs> by coming to Indriya Sangara, restrainment of your faculties, basically by being mindful. Okay? And this craving has what as its source? Craving has feeling as its source. Okay, here the Buddha describes dependent origination. Um, he's, he's starting from uh, craving, uh, and just you know he's getting to describe it, and what this feeling uh, and this feeling has what as its source. Feeling has contact as its source. How many contacts? Eye contact, ear contact, you know, all kinds of six contacts. Okay. Um, how many feelings? Three. Pleasant, unpleasant, and neither painful nor pleasant. Okay. 
Um, how many cravings? Three. Okay, let's unpack this. Tanha is the word for it. Kama tanha, bhava tanha, vibhava tanha. Put this into Indian context where the analytic view existed. Okay? Um, kama tanha is craving for sensual uh, form, sensual existence, which is why we are here. We all have sensual desire. We are born as human beings and we chase after the sensual stuff. And all these animals also have strong sensual desire, they too chase this stuff. And heavenly beings also have sensual desire, they uh, are attached to sen uh, divine uh, forms and stuff, divine sounds and so on. And then um, uh, Bhava Tanha, you know, Kama Tanha is you know, wanting the Kamas, sensuality. Bhava tanha is wanting to exist, wanting to exist, you know, uh, you, this you could mean, you know, some people want to, you know, be immortal, you know, some emperors in India, uh, in China have taken um, some chemical tried, trying to be immortal and this didn't, this actually killed him. Um, but again, wanting to exist um, means that people have the desire to continue <coughs> the existence, the self, um, in the next, next birth and the next birth and the next birth, thinking that they will be united with some, some God um, in a future existence when their karma is right, or um, that they will end it. Other people have the vibhavatanha, that is very destructive, that they get into the sense that there is this annihilation, that this is the only birth they have, and upon death nothing happens. And therefore, we should not care about mother, father, precepts, the societal values, and just enjoy as much as possible, uh, because this will be the only chance we get. And we have people among us who think this way. So uh, the Sanskrit tradition uh, believed that yava jivet, um, sukhang jivet. As long as you live, live happily. Rinam krutva grutam privet. No. Take a loan and drink ghee. That's the best food they had. Ghee, you know, just take a loan and drink, uh, consume ghee as much because it brings up sensuality and they can indulge. Basmi bhutasya dehasya, in this body that gets destroyed, punara gamanam kruta, how do you know if it will come back to you? <laughs> like this is the only time for you to enjoy. So this is a kind of views, you know, they were, that was circ being circulated there in, in, in that society. This is why a Buddha is actually needed to unpack such teachings and with profound self-realization to teach it to the world. Okay, back to, uh, so this feeling has what as its source, feeling has contact as its source and this contact has what as its source, contact has a sixfold base as its source. You know the sixfold base, right? Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Um, contact, okay. And sixfold, ha this sixfold ha base has what as its source? The sixfold base has mentality and materiality as its source. Nama, rupa. Materiality is the rupa, the body, and mentality is the nama the naming thing. Okay, what is naming? Um, um, so, passa, contact, again, there is passa repeated here, and then when you are naming, you need feeling, kind of uh, feeling, and volition, um, and consciousness. Okay, passa, uh, this is not described here, uh, in the mentality part, 
uh, nama part you know we describe it as nama rupa which is a very important teaching in buddhism um visuddhi magga the path of purification begins by describing this uh union um, that it is tied together mentality needs materiality to depend on uh and those who untie this arrived at the purification when you s- don't see you in any of uh, in mentality or materiality or in between you untie this uh, conundrum this tying um i will revisit that so don't worry about uh, remembering any of these things and this mentality and materiality has what as its source mentality and materiality has consciousness as its source so ni- when you become conscious the two things unite okay and this consciousness has what as its source consciousness has formations as its source and these formations have what as their source so formations uh, ha- as what as their origin f- um, from what are they born and produced formations have ignorance as their source ignorance as their origin and they are born and produced from ignorance now ignorance is called avijja avijja means not knowing vijja means knowing um when we talk about formations there are three kinds for the word for formation is sankara like constructing um making doer that sense um kaya sankara that is the bodily formations vachi sankara that is the verbal formations and mano sankara mental formations and you know now that verbal formations disappear in what jhana in the second jhana okay this is why we ask you to not talk <laughs> if you talk you fall back to 3 days behind and that your mind gets active and um you actually don't touch this kind of very fine states uh, instead you non verbally radiate loving kindness compassion and that way you can you prepare the ground fertile ground f- to for the flowers to bloom so again um kaya sankara is the in breath and out breath because the breath is produced by the body and vachi sankara is vitakka and vichara thinking and examining thoughts you know, always six aring and coming bringing up the wholesome in simple terms okay and it it's very simple and mano sankara is um, volitional stuff um um perceptions feelings and consciousness get it perceptions feelings and consciousness and why do we then say visankara gatan chitta it is that the mind goes into no formations no constructing this is when the mind experiences cessation that the mind won't have any way to produce the formations one thing ceases another thing ceases this is why your meditation has to be very very keenly done with a very very refined level of mindfulness with so much awareness and with so much um unconditional joy and effort to really understand the dhamma really understand it if not you will actually hear it but you will not experience it or see it okay um forward exposition on arising so because with ignorance as condition okay 
you are in grade 1 again ok. Um, with formations as condition, with consciousness as condition, with mentality, materiality as condition, with the sixfold base as condition, with contact as condition, with feeling as condition, with craving as condition, with clinging as condition, with habitual tendencies as condition, with birth as condition, such whole mass of suffering. Okay. <coughs> now, um, pay attention to this actually. Here, um, if you reflect on the Bodhisattva's biography, Bodhisattva <coughs> is the one aspiring to be awakened. He, his father expected him to be a universal monarch and prevented him from seeing aging people. And he, as an intelligent person, must have wondered why. It's obvious that people are aging. And he prevented, you know, death. Because he, his father knew that this son is, you know, always into meditation and stuff. From, you know, small age, he was into meditation, not interested in other stuff. He came to this world for a purpose. He never got angry. He was just not actually the king type. King supposed to get angry and go to war and destroy, but he's opposite of it. <laughs> and um, so one day, this is like seeing the four nimit nimitta, seeing the four signs. This alarmed him like, wow, this is happening. It's easy to see this in India, but he went. Uh, to a park one day, the park prepared for him. He had three palaces to live, like summer palace, winter palace, and autumn palace, like that. So there was like, he only saw the beauty in the world. That is what, you know, this is a loving father, but kind of obsessed with this idea. Um, he saw a um, really old person. He questioned, asked his uh, companion, Channa, you know, is this, does this happen to everybody? And then he saw a really sick person. He asked, does this happen to everybody? He saw a dead body being carried uh, to uh, the channel ground. Does this happen to everybody? So he started questioning. Um, and then he met a monk. And the monk is someone who you know, must have told him the truth, like, you know, the worldly life won't give you answers, but monastic life will, you, will give you the answer. So it's actually from there he started questioning. It's that uh, questioning that actually revealed to him the dependent origination. So he started from, uh, and you will, you know, keep that story in mind and how the reverse order works, okay? Maybe I should switch to this document. Yeah. Um, the Buddha, with yeah. birth as condition, aging and death comes to be. So it was said, now monks, do aging and death have birth as condition or not? How do you take it in this case? Okay, so can I stop here for a bit? Sure. Um, birth happens in four ways Andraja, Jalabuja, Sansedaja, Opapatika. So, Andraja is those, are those that are born through eggs, Jalabuja is those that are born from the wombs, Sansedaja is those that are born in moisture. And Opapatika is like divine beings that are spontaneously arisen. 
So this is very big thing. And this knowledge was available then because of those who did meditation and saw beings spontaneously arising and it was a knowledge that was accessible at the time. And it helped him to prepare this kind of profound and complete teaching. So you can see that once someone is born, aging happens. <laughs> uh, see, we reflect on it. I am subject to aging, right? It's like that. With habitual tendencies as condition, birth comes to be. So habitual tendencies, actually, let's also look at it as existence, you know. Habitual tendencies is an easy way to understand it in your meditation. But existing, like bhava, happens in sensual realms, happens in formed realms, the jhana realms, brahma realms, and then formless realms. So this is, this is bhava because that's how far you have developed your mind and you stay there in that inclination. Um, so with habitual tendencies, or existence as condition, birth comes to be, so it was said. Um, so you see the two teachers that the Buddha had, Alaraka Lama and Uddhaka Ramaputta. He, he actually didn't need a teacher uh, after that. He tried them. And he, even after enlightenment, wanted to go help these teachers. But they were not accessible. They had, one of them had died just seven days before, and the other one... Uh, perhaps a year before, I don't remember the exact uh, time. Um, but they only reached as far as the attainments beyond the jhanas, the seventh and the one before, nothingness and neither perception nor non-perception. I'm not actually sure, it's not coming to my mind. So, But that means they are there in a very, very fine state of mind and the, even the Buddha is not um, able to help them in that situation. Um, that in a formless realm, you can see how dangerous it could be without the Dhamma, that someone can get stuck in that kind of a place because of the view that that is the furthest you can go. Okay, that, um, that birth can happen. That kind of birth can happen. So it was said, now monks, does birth have Habitual tendencies as, it's actually their habitual tendency toward that jhana. <laughs> that is why they are still there as condition or not. Or how do you take it in this case? With clinging as condition, Habitual tendencies come to be. So it was said, now monks, does habitual tendencies have clinging as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does clinging have craving as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does craving have feeling as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does feeling have contact as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Feeling has contact as condition, but does it be taken in this case? With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does contact have the sixfold base as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Contact has the sixfold base as condition, Venerable Sir. Does we take it in this case? With the sixfold base as condition, 
With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does the sixfold base have mentality and mat materiality as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? The sixfold base has mentality and materiality as a condition for the number of serves. Thus, we take it in this case, with mentality and materiality as a condition, the sixfold base comes to be. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality come to be. So it was said, now monks, does mentality, materiality have consciousness as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With formations as condition, Consciousness comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does consciousness have formations as condition or not? How do you take it in this case? Consciousness has formations as condition or not, Thus we take it in this case. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. With ignorance as condition, formations come to be. So it was said, now monks, do formations have ignorance as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Okay. Um, so the word ignorance actually is not knowing for noble truths. Chatu Arya Satcha. You will, in your meditation, you will say to yourself, What a truth that this suffering exists. What a truth that it arises this way. What a truth that this suffering can be eradicated. What a truth that there is this path toward eradication of suffering. You will see it and then the ignorance is no more. You have seen it through reasoning and through understanding. So the first truth in Dhamma Chakka Sutta is to be comprehended. There is a thing to be heard first and then comprehended by knowledge. That is, otherwise you are not deleting ignorance <laughs> from the links. It's not possible. You just see the truth. That's why it's placed in the beginning as the first factor that, you know, you listen to teachings, you analyze it with Dhamma, and you understand it. When you come to understanding, you see how the links work. Otherwise, you get, you know, if you try to erase the links, you, you get deleted. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not what we are doing. It's actually understanding that is needed here. You also see which links has suffering. Clinging has suffering. Craving has suffering. You will see that how other conditions like contact, feeling, they contribute to that kind of clinging. So some links are here to be understood. Some links actually will be eradicated, eliminated. Some links will show you how the whole thing works. You know, that is, if you pay attention right now, um, you will see the Dhamma. Clinging is actually a upadana. Upadana, um, upa means closely, adana means grasping, really holding closely. Um, you can, you, you have, you know, five clinging aggregates, you know, the rupa as a clinging aggregate, that is the body, and also the visual forms, ear, sound forms, nasal forms and uh, olfactory, gustatory, all these forms. And you will cling to these. And um, also the feelings, you cling to the feelings, the pleasant feelings and so on. But painful feelings you don't cling but you reject them. This is also due to you know, clinging toward the pleasant feelings. You want more of the pleasant feelings. Um, and you also 
perceptions, can, you know, there is clinging toward certain perceptions, colors, and the way you want to perceive the world. And volitions, there is clinging there too. And sankharas, formations, there is clinging there too. There is also another um, clinging set. Um, clinging toward sensuality, um, clinging toward forms, you know, form riyam, the jhanas. This can happen in those who have done jhana meditations that they like it so much and they stay there forever. That kind of clinging. What other clingings do we have? Yeah, self clinging to a self view actually. Yeah, clinging to a self view. Uh, this uh, this is actually a wrong view. That's like a flood. This the Buddha described it as a really fast moving flood that you get caught up in. And ignorance is another flood. Wrong view is another flood. Um, an existence, habitual tendencies is another flood. Um, okay, uh, one second. Um, Kama yoga, bhava yoga, ditti yoga, avijja yoga. Avijja is ignorance, is another flood. Of course, you do rites and rituals because of ignorance, right? Okay, anything else? Let's continue. Um, good monks, so you say thus, and I also say thus, when this exists, that comes to be, with the arising of this, that arises, that is, with ignorance as condition, formation, with formations as condition, with consciousness as condition, with mentality, materiality as condition, with the sixth fold base as condition, with contact as condition, with feeling as condition, with craving as condition, with clinging as condition, with habitual tendencies as condition, with birth as condition. Such, Such is the of this whole land. Okay. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of formations. With the cessation of formations comes the cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of mentality. With the cessation of mentality, materiality comes the cessation of this. With the cessation of the sixfold base comes the cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual With the cessation of habitual tendencies comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth. Okay, there is a question why here toward, but with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of formations. So, um, I mentioned formations um, to be, you know, bodily, verbal and mental formations through progressive stages of your jhanas and then arupas and come into the state of um, neither perception nor non-perception, that too is a perception. <laughs> when that does not manifest, there is nothing to perceive and you see how consciousness has nothing to be conscious on, how it does not manifest any longer, that no contact. And some insight arises from this experience, but there is fear arising in you after reflecting on it later that, oh, Am I going to be extinct? <laughs> That's not. And you will read the Majjhima Nikaya 43 and 44 and understand that your breath and your ayu, ayu is the 
life faculty, life uh, jivit indriya, the what is it called, uh, the continuum, vitality. vitality actually, because of the existence of your um, lifespan and vitality, you actually continue to exist. You don't <laughs> uh, die there. Okay, so. Buddha has answered all our questions there. And through seeing that on your own uh, understanding, nobody has to tell you this now. No matter how many people try to convince you otherwise, you know through your own seeing that this is the Dhamma, this is the truth. And nobody has to say otherwise. And it's possible. <laughs> okay? Um, reverse order questionnaire on cessation. The Buddha, with the cessation of birth comes the cessation of aging and death. So it was said, now monks, do aging and death cease with the cessation of birth or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of habitual tendencies comes the cessation of birth. So it was said, now monks, does birth cease with the cessation of habitual tendencies or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Birth ceases with the cessation of habitual tendencies and also. Thus we take in this case, with the cessation of habitual tendencies, the cessation of birth occurs. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendencies. So it was said, now monks, so do habitual tendencies cease with the cessation of clinging or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Habitual tendencies cease with the cessation of clinging and also Thus we take it in this case, with the cessation of clinging, the cessation of habitual tendencies occur. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. So it was said, now monks, does clinging cease with the cessation of craving or not? Or how do you take it in this case? With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. So it was said, now monks, does craving cease with the cessation of feeling or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Craving ceases with the cessation of feeling and also, take it in this case, with the cessation of feeling and the cessation With the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling. So it was said, now monks, does feeling cease with the cessation of contact or not? How do you take it in this case? Feeling ceases with the cessation of contact and also serves. Thus we take it in this case, with the cessation of contact, the cessation of feeling occurs. With the cessation of the sixfold base comes the cessation of contact. So it was said, now monks, does contact cease with the cessation of the sixfold base or not? How do you take it in this case? With the cessation of mentality, materiality comes the cessation of the sixfold base. So it was said, now monks, does the sixfold base cease with the cessation of mentality, materiality or not? How do you take it in this case? The sixfold With the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of mentality, materiality. So it was said, now monks, does mentality, materiality cease with the cessation of consciousness or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Mentality, materiality ceases with the cessation of consciousness. Thus we take it in this case, with the cessation of consciousness, the cessation of mentality, materiality occurs. With the cessation of formations comes the cessation of consciousness. So it was said, now monks, does consciousness cease with the cessation of formations or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Consciousness ceases with the cessation of formations or Thus we take it in this case, with the cessation of formations, the cessation of consciousness occurs. 
with the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of formations so it was said now monks do formations cease with the cessation of ignorance or not or how do you take it in this case Recapitulation on cessation. Good monks, so you say thus, and I also say thus, when this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. That is, with the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of formations. With the cessation of formations comes the cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of with the cessation of mentality, materiality comes the cessation of the sixfold base. With the cessation of the sixfold base comes the cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual With the cessation of habitual tendencies comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth. So one time Venerable Ananda, the attendant monk of the Buddha, went to the Buddha and said, um, I get it, Venerable Sir, I understand the dependent origination. At which point the Buddha said, don't say that Ananda, don't say that Ananda. This teaching is Gambhiro, Duddhaso, Duranubodo, deep, hard to see and hard to realize. But when one sees dependent origination, he sees the Dhamma. When one sees the Dhamma, he sees me, that is the Buddha. So in each link, there is uh, work to be done in your own mind and in meditation. But in doing that, <coughs> please take the 12 links into your mind um, and or keep this handout with you and give a mini workshop to your mind to perhaps memorize it a little bit, uh, just the arising and then you can go backward uh, toward the cessation. Monks memorized it in Pali and when Bhante Vimalaransi passed away, we chanted it for him. Um, we chanted it in Pali and he, I think he was so elated, he was so moved by it. Uh, you can see the monk in him really rejoicing in that. Um, and the cessation phenomena. This is the best karma one can have actually, to hear this teaching so that, you know, it's easy to give up any, f any kind of attachment he had toward the body, toward any feeling, toward any uh, formations or anything. Now where do I go from here? Uh, does it say here? Okay. Okay. Yeah, very little to go. Yeah. Because knowing and seeing in this way, would you run back to the past thus? Were we in the past? This is all kinds of thinking you do. Thinking is really, you know, not helping you <laughs> to understand this. Um, it's not through just, you know, too much, you know, you can see, like, were we not in the past? What, what were we in the past? How were we in the past? You know, having been what? <coughs> what did we become in the past? No, Venerable Sir. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you run forward to the future thus? Shall we be in the future? Shall we not be in the future? What shall we be in the future? There's kind of we, I, existence, all of it. But right here, right now, you see things dependently arising. There is no we, I in here. How shall we be in the future? Having been what? What shall we become in the future? No, Venerable Sir. Knowing and seeing in this way, this is important, knowing and seeing this way. Uh, would you now be inwardly perplexed about the present thus? <coughs> am I? Am I not? What am I? <laughs> 
how am I? Where has this being come from? So there's a being concept here. Where will it go? No venerable sir. All that thinking is completely unnecessary. It is just called papancha, proliferations. Majjhiminikaya madhupindika sutta. Okay? Because knowing and seeing in this way, would you speak thus? The teacher is repeated by us. We speak as we do out of respect for the teacher. Actually, no. Because you see it yourself. No, Venerable Sir. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you speak thus? The recluse says this, and we speak thus at the by bidding of the recluse. No, Venerable Sir. Basically, Kalama Sutta. Just don't believe it just because some recluse said it. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you acknowledge another teacher? No, Venerable Sir, because you know you got it. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you return to the observance, tumultuous debates, and auspicious signs of ordinary recluses and Brahmins, taking them as the core of the holy life? No, Venerable Sir. And this is the thing, astrology and stuff, and uh, there is an auspicious time to meditate, and you should be meditating on Friday. Mm -hmm. Um, some you know evil things will happen that kind of thinking and also uh, engaging in arguments with people you know using this teaching this is completely unnecessary you say you're right <laughs> you will go back to reflecting on dependent origination ar arising and cessation that's all you need to do it, it resolves all the conflicts you see how conflicts can arise you see how conflicts get resolved you don't see an arguer or winner here. Okay. You, you know, jayang verang pasavati, uh, that means when you are the winner, you are infusing hatred in someone who lost it. Okay. Um, upasanto sukanseti, someone who is calm, he sleeps happily, having abandoned jaya parajang, winning and losing. You are not involved in any winning or any losing. There is no competition in you. That is in uh, Dhammapada. Okay? Do you speak only of what you have known, seen and understood for yourselves? Yes, Venerable Sir. So, you are your own teacher. <laughs> Bhante Upekaranda, we have said it to you 50 times in the interviews. You are your own teacher here. It's from this that comes uh, that kind of understanding. Good bhikkhus, so you have been guided by me with this dhamma, which is visible here and now, immediately effective, inviting inspection, onward leading, to be experienced by the wise for themselves. These are the six qualities of dhamma. For it was with reference to this that it has been said because this Dhamma is visible here and now, immediately effective, inviting inspection, onward leading, to be experienced by the wise for themselves. Round of existence, conception to maturity. Because the descent of the embryo takes place through the union of three things. Here there is the union of the mother and father, but the mother is not in season and the Gandhabha is not present. That means a being who is ready to be conceived. In this case, no descent of an embryo takes place. Here there is the union of the mother and father and the mother is in season, but the Gandhabha is not present. In this case too, no descent of the embryo takes place. But when there is the union of the mother and father, and the mother is in season, and the Gandhabha is present, through the union of these three things, the descent of the embryo takes place. The mother then carries the embryo in her womb for nine or ten months with, with, such, with much anxiety, as a heavy burden. Then at the end of nine or ten months, the mother gives birth with, birth with much anxiety. 
as a heavy burden. Then when the child is born, she nourishes it with her own blood. For the mother's breast milk is called blood in the noble one's dis discipline. Noble one is the Buddha here. Um, noble one's discipline is actually practicing the noble truths and becoming noble in your, in your own ways, in your own uh, understanding. When he grows up and his faculties mature, the child plays at such games as toy plows, tip cat, somersaults, toy windmills, toy measures, toy cars, and a toy bow and arrow. When he grows up and his faculties mature still further, the youth enjoys himself provided and endowed with the five chords of sensual pleasure with forms cognizable by the eye, sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. On seeing a form with the eye, he lusts after it if it is pleasant, pleasing, he dislikes it. If it is unpleasing, he this craving. He abides with mindfulness of the body unestablished, with a limited mind, and he does not understand it as it actually is, the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. So, this is a uh, deliverance of mind is cheto vimutti. Uh, this gets shaken. Deliverance by wisdom is final deliverance. So cheto vimutti, when it is akupa, unshaken, it is final deliverance. So you go through several deliverances here that you enter jhanas, there is some liberation there from sensual um, hindrances and so on. And these are many deliverances until you get to the full deliverance of the mind, full vimutti, full moksha, that uh, your mind actually is dying to have, but you don't even see that. Okay. Engaged as uh, he is, favoring and opposing, Whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he delights in that feeling, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As he does so, delight arises in him. Now, delight in feeling is clinging. Get it? With his clinging as condition, being comes to be. With being as condition, birth with birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pray, pain, grief and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind, he lusts after it. If it is pleasing, he lust after it. If he dislikes it, if it is unpleasing. Now, delight in feeling is clinging. With his clinging as condition, being comes to be. With being as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair comes to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. The ending of the round. Here because this is a gradual training. A Buddha, Tathagata, appears in the world, accomplished, fully enlightened. He purifies his mind from doubt. This is actually a, we have to do we have to go to that sutta or should we just do that. Okay. Twenty seven. <laughs> okay. Um. We are uh, I should have bookmarked it before. 
this is 25 26 27 This is Chula Hatti Padopama Sutta, the shorter discourse on the simile of the elephant footprint, uh, 11.18. So, the Buddha appears in the world accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of the world's incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. These are nine qualities of the Buddha that people chant every day. He declares this world with its gods, its maras, its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, with which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the dhamma, good in the beginning, that is the sila part, that is virtues, precepts. Good in the middle, that is the samadhi, the jhanas. And good in the end, that is the panya, how to gain insight, otherwise called dream practice. <laughs> With the right meaning and praising, and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. A householder or householder's son or one born in some other clan hears that Dhamma. On hearing the Dhamma, he acquires faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, he considers thus, household life is crowded and dusty, life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy, while living in a home, to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and go forth, or saffron robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. This we recite uh, when someone is ord getting ordained here. It's in that uh, little uh, booklet. On a later occasion, abandoning uh, a small or a large fortune, abandoning a small or large circle of relatives, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the yellow robe, and goes forth from the home life into homelessness. Having thus gone forth and possessing the bhikkhu's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he abstains from killing li living beings, with rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, merciful, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning the taking of what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given, taking only what is given, expecting only what is given. By not stealing, he abides in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy, living apart abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse, abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech, he speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world, abandoning malicious speech, he abstains from malicious speech, he does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people from these, nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus, he is one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendships, who enjoys conquered, rejoices in conquered, delights in conquered, a speaker of words that promote conquered. Abandoning harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks such words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip, he abstains from gossip. He speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline 
at the right time he speaks such words as are worth recording reasonable moderate and beneficial he abstains from injuring seeds and plants he practices eating only one meal a day basically this is eka bhatta bhogi this also is translated as eating only um in the one that's in the morning time uh, so you you abstain from eating after that abstaining from eating at night and outside the proper time he abstains from dancing singing music and theatrical shows we don't have those here he abstains from wearing garlands smartening himself with scent and embellishing himself with unguents he ab- abstains from high and large couches he abstains from accepting gold and silver because it's heavy to just abandon them you can just go anywhere when you don't have those how high and luxurious uh, bed under a tree somewhere <laughs> or some in some um, cottage somewhere you just close the tree or close the door and go like you don't even have to you just those days they chose to live under trees so simple there's no saying goodbye or anything you just go where you want to go <laughs> there's no mortgage to pay there's no um, <laughs> insurance to pay and health insurance and worry so much it's just your walking takes care of your health and eating just enough takes care of your health you just they just had it freely and they just didn't care when they die and um, emergency care or anything if they died they died they were just ready <laughs> he abstains from accepting raw meat he abstains from accepting women and girls because this is a burden um, to accept raw meat and now he has to cook he just goes on arms round and he just accepts whatever is offered and he eats it uh, abstains from accepting women and girls you know of course you are practicing celibacy and you don't need them as helpers this can lead into conflicting uh, situations um he abstains from accepting men and women slaves he abstains from accepting goats and sheep you know people would offer anything to you um in in that context brahmans um they they received all these offerings he abstains from accepting f- fowl fowl and pigs he abstains from accepting elephants cattle horses and mares he abstains from accepting fields and land he abstains from going on errands and running messages he abstains from buying and selling he abstains from false weights false metals false measures he abstains from accepting bribes deceiving defrauding and trickery he abstains from wounding murdering by binding brigandage plunder and violence he becomes content with robes to protect his body and with arms food to maintain his stomach and wherever he goes he sets out taking only these with him just as a bird wherever it goes flies with its wings as its only burden this is called sapatta bharu sakunovia the bird only has wings as the burden have you seen birds taking a luggage no so too the bhikkhu becomes content with robes to protect his body and with arms food to maintain his stomach and wherever he goes he sets out taking only these with him possessing this aggregate of noble virtue he experiences with within himself a bliss that is blameless no one is blaming him including himself on seeing a form with the eye he does not grasp at its signs and features since if he left the eye faculty unguarded evil unwholesome states of co- covetousness and grief might invade him he practices the way of its restraint he guards the eye faculty he understands the rex- restraint of the eye faculty 
on hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind. He does not grasp at its signs and features, since if he left the mind faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the mind faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the mind faculty. Possessing this noble restraint of the faculties, he experiences within himself a bliss that is unsullied. He becomes one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning, who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robes and carrying his outer robe and bowl, who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating, who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent. This is Sampajanya, full awareness. Knowing that your mind is not supporting uh, defilements or the grasping on, on signs and features, basically. Possessing this aggre aggregate of noble virtue and this noble restraint of the faculties and possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness, he resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root. On seeing a form with, no, uh, having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, that is stilling of the six hours, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana. With the fading away as well of rapture, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not lust after it, if it is pleasing. He does not dislike it, if it is unpleasing. He abides with mindfulness of the body established, with an immeasurable mind, and he understands that as it actually is, the deliverance of mind and deliverance of by wisdom, wherein those evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. Anupad is a complete uh, liberation. Having thus abandoned favoring and opposing whatever feeling he, f in, uh, there's still yet to, a little bit to go, whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he does not delight in that feeling, <coughs> welcomes it, or remain holding to it. As he does not do so, diligent in feelings ceases in delight in feelings ceases in him. With the cessation of his delight comes cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of being. With the cessation of being, cessation of birth, with the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind. He does not lust after it if it is pleasing. He does not dislike it if it is unpleasing. With the cessation of his delight comes cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of being. With the cessation of being, cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, 
pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Conclusion Because remember this discourse of mine briefly, was it brief? <laughs> <laughs> as deliverance in the destruction of craving. But remember the Bhikkhu Sati, son of a fisherman, as caught up in a vast net of craving, in the trammel of craving. That is what the Blessed One said. The Bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. What do we do with this? Well, it's just a chart of the links. <coughs> Okay, you all ha you all have it. I think we have already gone through, gone over all this. So, yeah, that's uh, the end. Any questions?